an infectious current of freedom tore through Africa in the 1950s. A continent largely ruled by European powers woke up and demanded self-government from their colonial masters. Sardona and uh, our great friend Odo from the west, Azikwe from the east, Ahmad Bello from the north. They ganged up together to fight for, for Nigeria's independence. race course for the greatest ceremony of all, Nigeria's independence at midnight on September the 30th, 1960. The bands of the Royal Marines, the Queen's Own Nigeria Regiment and the police open the tattoo. Then police motorcyclists show their skill. There are 12 of them, all trainees, and they give a display of cycling which is extremely skillful. We all attended the independence celebration. We were all at the stadium. I was seated behind my father. I was the only person in the whole of the VIPs time who did not sit in a chair. Because all the chairs were taken up by VIPs. I can't forget that day for a number of reasons. One of them was the fireworks. I was in Lagos together with my late father, Sultan Abubakar III, at the late race course in Lagos. At midnight, they put off the lights, brought down the British flag, and put full light as they put up the Nigerian flag. What I love most, I think, was when when the jets flew over the stadium that morning and uh, you could feel that thunderous, you know, occasion. I was in school for the first time, maybe the last time in that school. We were served jollof rice on that day. It was a party. <laughs> Mama had made my sister and I a special fabric that was made for the independence. So we wore our independence out it. And it was really a very festive mood in school. It was a very memorable day. All uh, enlightened Nigerians are determined to ensure that Nigeria remains united. But not all Nigerians are enlightened. Uh, not all Nigerians are enlightened, but the majority, uh, quite a good number are enlightened, and the majority are politically conscious to realize the advantages that are cool from uh, Nigeria remaining as a, as, a, as a single nation. The whole idea is to get together so that the Nigeria could grow up as one single country. Believe, believe it or not, at the time, everybody was, be, was believing about one single country. All these divisions that you find you found later, it was all developed later. But from the very beginning, there was only one single Nigeria. Everyone was proud of one single Nigeria. I'm a Nigerian. I was, I was not a Yoruba man. I'm not so, so, so. Everybody was, was a Nigerian, and we're all proud of being Nigerian. If I am asked whether I'm happy because Nigeria is free, and the Nigerian government appears to be stable, and the people of Nigeria are apparently satisfied that the price of freedom and the price our leaders paid for it were worth the sacrifice, I would answer in the affirmative. The honeymoon did not last long. Crisis after crisis crippled the infant democracy. There was the workers' strike, the creation of the Midwestern state, the Adaka Boro revolt in the Niger Delta, and the Western region crisis. On January the 15th, 1966, Nigeria's experiment with self-rule stuttered to a bloody halt. The army took over the reins of power. The man at present being put forward is the army commander, General Agui Ironzi who arrived at the heavily guarded parliament buildings to hold the new administration's first press conference. The federal military government of Nigeria has taken over the administration of the country. 
functions of the federal military government will be exercised by the Supreme Military Council and details of which will be announced later. Permanent secretaries in charge of federal ministries will continue in their office, carrying out the normal functions of government, and they shall be directly responsible to the federal military government when constituted. May I ask the General whether he regards his administration as a permanent or a caretaker administration? My main concern is to restore law and order as soon as possible. I think the first coup was the greatest mistake. The first coup. When you look at the leaders at that time, Balewa, Azikwe, Awolowo, Sadauna, most of them died without a penny. They were working. I remember in the north, Sadauna educated us, sent us to school. We had boarding primary schools. We paid no fees. We were clothed, uniformed, fed. And we went to secondary school, the same thing. Those were leaders who knew the value of leadership. That coup brought the end of a very bright future for this country. When this country had an independent, they were about a par with Brazil. <laughs> but today we are not even 10% of Brazil. Chief of Afemi Awolo, which is many talents and discipline and courage with all that he did for Western region. I want you to remember that Western region had television, the first television in Africa, and that before France. I remember one of the prime ministers of Great Britain saying, I will all have the, the mental capacity to run an Ameri American Britain together. Ironsi was toppled in a bloody coup six months later. General Yakubu Gawan, who succeeded him, led Nigeria into a long, destructive civil war. From the no-man's land near the front lines, children are brought in starving. If the war goes on and the refugees prefer any fate rather than pass under federal control, mass starvation will again kill many of the six million Biafrans now crowded into their shrinking territory. We have fought a long, bitter battle, and it has ended in a victory for common sense. After the war, Gowan reneged on a promise to hand over power to civilians in 1976. A restless political class grumbled. The army listened. This was the moment Gowan was told he had been overthrown while attending the OAU summit. I appreciate this very much, and with regard to the black people all over the world, I think... After the assassination of General Muratala Muhammad, his deputy, General Olushegun Obasanjo, took the political transition program to its promised end. I never contemplated coming into government. I joined the army to soldier. When the unexpected happened of those who carried out the coup in 1975, invited three of us, late Muritala, myself, and Yakubu Danjuma, to take over the reins of government and the reins of the military. Um, we accepted to do our best um, for the country. And of course, those who uh, carried out the coup and invited us obviously had certain amount of confidence in us and trust in us. And um, so we, 
they didn't give us any blueprint or anything except to say run uh, the affairs of the country and the military well. Nigeria's return to democracy was colorful. Although there were five candidates contesting for the presidency, the contest came down to two figures from the First Republic. A former minister, Cheyu Shagari, and a former leader of the opposition, Obafemi Owolowo. The first time I saw him was in Ikene, but he was disappointed. But again, he took it in his stride because he was satisfied that he had done his best, that he had passed the message across to the people as best as he could. He could not do more. And if that was the decision, then so be it. Nigeria's second experiment with democracy was shorter than the first. The same ills that bedeviled the country in the 1960s returned in the 80s. Four years, three months later, the army returned to power. Road, indiscipline, corruption, squandermania, misuse and abuse of public office for self or group aggrandizement, which had assumed debilitating proportions in the last few years, will be dealt with ruthlessly, no matter whoever may be involved. The private sector has also declared... ...take this opportunity to declare once again Therefore, that this administration attaches the greatest importance to constructive and helpful criticisms as well as the freedom of the press. And to declare further that the administration also attaches the greatest importance of fundamental human rights. General Babangida delighted Nigerians when he unveiled a transition program that would terminate military rule in 1990. But as the months rolled into years, the only thing certain about the transition was its uncertainty. Elections were held and cancelled. Candidates were clear to run for the presidency and banned. By 1992, the road to civil rule was as unclear as it had been on that August day in 1985 when General Babangida took over. IBB had been running uh, a transition program that totally lacked credibility. Um, he had proposed um, a civilian rule timetable that he wasn't faithful to. And uh, in every regard, you know, he had totally lost all his uh, political credit capture. From August 1985, when I became the military president, by one week after that, and Nigerians said I didn't want to move. I was seven days in office. So it, to me, it doesn't uh, matter. I knew what I wanted to achieve, and I went all out for it. The senior military class, early that year, had a meeting at uh, the Command of Mess Marina and uh, agreed that at all costs, elections must be conducted, and the military should completely get off the scene. Every time when I increase the price of my motor, it go be like make my passenger cut my neck. The price of motor they go up, the price of tire they go up. If Gary Wayman they chop, in price they go up every day. I can't they look television yesterday. Now I see this man with them called Tofa. He like said the man gets sent so. Now I go vote for. Tofa is the answer. On June 12th, vote for a man who knows your problems and knows how to solve them. Vote Bashir Othman Tofa for president. Vote NRC. Tofa is the answer. My brother, waiting you they think of. My sister, hell ever don't come. SDP, MKO, King Ben, action. MKO, King Ben, SDP, progress. Abiola na di hobo, SDP na di party to solve our problem and better our life. Oh. MKO, 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 action. Abiola, Abiola, Abiola. Bavangida on his own decided to create two parties, one to the left 
and one to the center. SDP and NRC. Single-handedly picked his two friends, M. Flora Viola for SDP and Alhaji Topa for NRC. These two people were picked by him. They are his personal friends. They were allowed to campaign. They were provided security. Pressure on me was heavier. We had interest as military, interest in making sure that the right man is put in place. Special Trofa, yes, he's my friend. Mashhur Abiola, yes, he's my friend. So typical Nigerians, they will say either way, he's a winner. Basic things like, like libraries. There are no books in, in any libraries, in primary schools, in secondary schools. There are no laboratory equipment. Boys doing their honors degree in, in sciences do what they call uh, um, theoretical practical. No, no, no. It was a contest, quite frankly, between the people, the politicians, and generally the political class, and elements of the military who did not want um, the, the, the country to progress towards uh, democratic governance. So um, the stakes were very high indeed. Without blowing my horns or beating my drums, you know, I can say that there had never been a campaign that was so well organized and so conferencibly done as my own campaign. The mandate given to us, reform the system, restore confidence in the system, get Nigerians involved, and we got Nigerians. We had articulate team. We were carrying Nigerians along with us. Questions were asked. I held media discussion, prayer conferences, periodically cleared air where people didn't understand. So, Increasingly, Nigerians developed confidence in this system. And uh, I bet you that's why when even after all the conventions people would come to the re-election, presidential election, Nigerians didn't mind Muslim Muslim ticket because the we consciousness had developed at highest level. Nigerians had begun to think of themselves as Nigerians, not as Igbos, not as Yorubas, not as Hausas, not as minorities. They saw in themselves something that tied them as economic interest. They identified with Nigeria. It was the mood of the nation when we started preparing for the mother of all the elections, the presidential election of 1993. <laughs> It was very much part of the free, fair, and peaceful process that we observed everywhere. So the conduct of the election was, was really impressive, and then the fact that it, it continues to be recognized as the most peaceful election that Nigeria has ever had. I think we were lucky in the general election because the candidate that faced us, Tofa, was himself not convinced that he was going to be president. So his campaign was a bit lackluster. He didn't put too much effort because uh, Abiola's uh, popularity was overwhelming and his support was uh, quite intimidating. We are very confident also that we will win this election because we didn't see any reason why uh, we could not win that election. People liked us. Uh, all the important people in the country, you know, sympathize with our views and what we intend to do. I knew at the time that uh, those elections and elections results were coming out, there is no way he, Bashar Tofa, could have won. Because based on what we have seen on the ground, he couldn't have won. It was a most historic election. The day that 
we forgot, Nigeria forget about religious differences. A day that Nigeria had two Muslim candidates, but MK Abiola and Babagana Kim Gibe won across the country. A day where we crossed and crushed all the tribal differences. Because it won, it got two thirds in the east all the way through. And it crushed its opponent in Kano, metropolitan Kano. It was a thunderous, loud explosion throughout Africa. At every local government level, I was getting the results. We were telling them in the command center, and we were, we were releasing the results on a state by state, even before INEC got the results. We all had the results from every polling unit. Uh, we had the collated results um, from all the local governments, from all the states. And we were just waiting. It was just the result of Taraba that was outstanding. Taraba reported the future for SDP, MKO Abiola. But they have to bring the certified document to the Central Coalition Center, controlled by the military. The National Electoral Commission was stopped abruptly from further counting for that announcement because of one state, the state of Taraba. That was how the crisis and the suspicion started. And also insisted that every commissioner from every state should present his results in person, even though we had all the results and there was no controversy. On the 23rd of June, 1993, around 10 o'clock in the morning, an officer called me from uh, Asarok to say that a press release had just been issued to the effect that the June 12th election results have been annulled and that NEC has been disbanded. I said, uh, why the president, you say he's on his way to Katsina to attend the burial of Al-Hajj Musa Eradua, the father of late Shehu Eradua, Jara Shehu Eradua, who died that morning. I joke that I hope it's not this announcement that has killed the old man. My reaction was one of incredulity because um, President Babangida was with us at the burial ceremony and he had just left and clearly he the way he interacted with everybody did not indicate to me that he had foreknowledge of a decision that he might have taken before coming to Katsina. So um, I, I, I didn't believe it. Quite frankly for many people and for many of us it was very very shocking to hear that uh, Professor Nwosu had been directed to stop counting the votes. And we later discovered that this was done at gunpoint, that even our more tanks were being moved around INEC headquarters then. All of us in the, in the Western Diplomatic Corps who had been working so hard in support of that process, we're, we're quite frankly angry. Uh, we felt that, that the Nigerian people were being badly let down. After the annulment, Nigeria drifted through half a decade of crisis, uncertainty, and fear that the country that had stayed one under self-rule for 33 years may come apart. Journalists and human rights activists bore the brunt of the ire of the military. There were detentions, imprisonments, assassinations. 
General Babangida, who had annulled the election, ceded power to corporate mogul Ernest Shonaka. Shonakon himself was overthrown less than three months later by General Sani Abacha. Abiola, who had won the election, was detained. After the death of General Sani Abacha, there was hope that the political logjam would be resolved. Then, four years into his detention, Abiola died mysteriously while meeting with the American diplomats in Abuja. Nigeria was now indeed in a pot of boiling water. Someone had to cool it down somehow. Nigeria was in turmoil. There is a lot of ag agitation from the politicians for the military to go back to the barracks and hand over to an elected uh, government. As a result of that agitation, there are a lot of uh, movements uh, spearheaded by NADECO campaigning and making life ungovernable uh, at that time for the military regime. As a result of which there are a lot of disturbances, a lot of curfews, a lot of skirmishes here and there, and a lot of things were not uh, what they should be. Then when Providence uh, brought me into power, not only the politicians in the country were divided, people were thinking for their regions and local governments rather than thinking for Nigeria. And that phenomenon was creeping gradually into the military. The military where we have uh, taken an oath to defend the constitution and defend the integrity of Nigeria, suddenly the military, suddenly the military started thinking about their regions and so on. And that is uh, unacceptable for us who took over the mantle of leadership. Nigerians wanted the military out of power. They wanted to have democracy. They wanted political parties and so on. So we try as much as possible to provide what Nigerians are asking, and we did. Typical military tradition, and what happens in most African countries, Abdul Salam will want to take at least three, four, or more years. Well, when the information became clear that no, Abdul Salam didn't want to stay beyond the year, and they wanted democracy to take off, people were all excited. Then I was a civil servant. I was not in politics then, but everybody expected that in a political dispensation, people interrogate issues. During military, you don't have a national assembly. You don't have state assemblies. So government decides to do whatever they want to do. Chief Olusegun Obasanjo re-emerged again as the leader of the Nigerian nation. After being at the top 20 years before, then as a military head of state. Your Excellencies, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, let me at this juncture congratulate our new president, General Matthew Aremu. And that I will devote myself and that I will devote myself to the service to the service and well-being and well-being of the people of Nigeria. Of the people of Nigeria. So help me God. So help me God. Democracy was back in Nigeria. After 16 years of military rule, Nigerians could finally determine their fates at the polling booth. But there was something missing. Successive presidents chose to ignore the election and personalities that had made Nigeria's longest uninterrupted romance with democracy possible. The June 12th election was a shadow trailing Nigeria's democracy. Abiola is the father the creator, the man who sacrificed everything, his comfort, his family life, is worth everything for the sake of this country, for the sake of the current democracy, whether they like it or not. 
In 2015, something unprecedented happened in Nigerian democracy. An opposition party won the presidential election against the ruling party. The new president, Mohamedou Bahari, decided it was time to honor the heroes of the past that made today possible. Following his declaration on Wednesday that henceforth, June 12, be observed as Democracy Day in Nigeria, and that some heroes of democracy be given national honors, President Muhammad Buhari has directed the Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Abu Bakr Malami, to take immediate steps to publish the order. We need to encourage Mr. President. What he has started took us 25 years to achieve. What the President did, the President meant well. We are supposed to support this. I want to believe it's a very serious and a very good handshake across Niger. And this is part of the things we must have to look after and ensure that Nigeria remains a united country. I got a call from the late chief of staff office, Madam Abakiari, followed by the office of the secretary of the federal government. I was just in this Mexican restaurant in the hotel by myself when the phone rang and it was my immediate junior brother, Jamu. He said, um, President Buhari is recognizing daddy on June 12th. When he said that, I just felt my body actually, my spirit just leave my body. I felt it lift off, almost as if to say that, well, my work here is done. I was so happy because it had already been 25 years that we had been waiting for any kind of acknowledgement. I heard it from my brother, uh, not my biological brother, but my adopted brother, Mr. Jindu Guzo, who my dad adopted as a son. So he called me and said, ah, am I listening to the news? I said, the news is always the same old thing. He said, I should turn it on. Ah, you don't give our Baba award. I said, who gave him? He said, ah, Buari. I said, what's the award about? said, they finally recognized uh, June 12th, and that um, MK Abiola will be given the recognition of the previous president, although it was not sworn in, and will be given the award of the, the uh, GCFR, Grand Commander of the Federal Republic, and that chief was also given GCON. So I turned on the TV, I screamed. I was actually in Saudi Arabia uh, performing the Hajj which is the Muslim uh, pilgrimage. And I was in Medina, actually. I had finished the rituals in Mecca. And I was rounding up in Medina, and I was called and told to come because there would be an event for which I would be required on June 12th. It was a happy, one well, of the happiest days to have eventually gotten the recognition I think he well deserves. Uh, for what he had done tonight for Nigeria. And despite everything, he has never gotten a national honor of any sort. He has gotten a lot of Chisasi titles across Nigeria, but not, never had a national honor. And the biggest honor to date has been from the people themselves. Giving him the GCFR was the next possible best thing they could have done or we could have done for all he had given up for everyone uh, to have a democratic uh, government. I consider it a great privilege to welcome all of you to this auspicious occasion and a historic day in the life of our dear nation, Nigeria. This is particularly significant event as it marks government's proclamation of June 12 as Democracy Day and its public acknowledgement of our heroes past whose supreme efforts led the foundation for our nascent democracy. It was unbelievable. I think the June 12th elections were annulled in 
1993. And President Buhari gave the uh, acknowledgement of June 12th in 2018, that's 25 years thereabouts. I believe that uh, despite concerted actions and lobby um, and pressure on various governments, beginning with the government of, uh, of Asanjo in 1999 uh, until the arrival of uh, President Buhari to the presidency, no much movement was made to acknowledge June 12th for what it was. And uh, that it was coming 25 years later. And that uh, action being taken by President Buhari was uh, unexpected, um, pleasant uh, shock. And um, I think there was relief that there was some level of closure to this festering wound um, in our democratic process and in our national psyche. Were you not worried or had second thought because there had been many presidents before you that didn't do what you did? Did it not bother you? This man was accepted, as I said, by the whole country. He went all over the country. He was understood by Nigerians. He was accepted, and he was elected. He picked uh, another Muslim like him. Nobody talked about religion. Nobody talked about ethnicity. And uh, I think we, we missed an opportunity there of really doing away with uh, religious and ethnic politics in Nigeria. May I now invite a member of the family of Chief Dani Faromi, who will be decorated this morning with the award of GCON, Mrs. Ganyat Bukola Faromi. I think I nearly misbehaved on that day because uh, out of exhilarating passion, my mom was there with us, so I said, well, this award, you are the man, woman, meant to go and collect it because you have been to all the 49 detention centers and the 15 prisons which this man has been held while in his lifetime. She said, ah, I'm the first one. I said, yes, I know, but people prefer to see you there because they know most of the pictures we see. Once she is released, she's there. Congratulate President Mohammed Buhari for this gesture. You are the first sensitive and reasonable head of state. We have had in this country you are the first head of state that has listened to his people and you have acted accordingly. June 12 is the foundation of democracy in this country. The recognition of Chief MKO Abiola as president elect in this country, not as a presumed winner. He was the winner. I thank God that I'm seen today. The fact that he was awarded that posthumously uh, indicates um, recognition of June 12th. And um, normally, the vice president is conferred the national honor of the grand commander of the um, Order of Niger which was uh, conferred on me, that also is a symbolic recognition of the f fact that the ticket prevailed.
Your Excellencies, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, I now have the singular honor and privilege of inviting Kola Abiola to please come forward to receive the posthumous award of his dad. The first thing I wanted to do was introduce myself as NQ to express the fact that I believe he was in the room that day. Your Excellency, I present Basharun Moshud Kashimawu Olawale Abiola for the conferment of the posthumous award of the Grand Commander of the Federal Republic, GCFR. Personally, I knew Leta Abiola and Baba Ganai Kingibe. The way he used his resources and energy to be accepted by the whole country, uh, I think is really commendable. And uh, the question of partisan politics in Nigeria involving religion and ethnicity would have gone. Look at what he did. He went as far as Maiduguri to pick a Muslim. He, is a, he was a Muslim. Baba Gana Kingibe is a Muslim from the north. But nobody talked about religion or that he, he was Yoruba and Baba Gana is Kanuri. People took them as Nigerian. I think that was the biggest success of Abiola which uh, made an impression in me that I, when I have the opportunity, I want to make sure that his name uh, has been uh, put in gold right, right away. Our decision to recognize and honor June 12 and its actors is in the national interest. It is aimed at settling national healing process and the reconciliation of the 25-year history wound caused by the annulment of the June 12 elections. I earnestly invite all Nigerians across all our national divide to accept it in good faith. President Buhari and Chief Abiola um, were very unlikely Fair to for President uh, Buhari to be magnanimous um, in acknowledging his victory. Uh, it was said that indeed Chief Aviola was a uh, key financier of the military push which uh, removed President Buhari when he was military head of state at the time. Generally, it was, it, normal human nature uh, not to be forgiving but uh, he said a lot of President Buhari that he had the magnanimity, the objectivity, the patriotism and the commitment to democracy that uh, such personal details didn't stop him from doing the right thing. Who would have ever believed, given the relationship that you had with Chief M.K. Adiola, that you would be the instrument God would use to honor this man and to bring reconciliation and healing to the country. You apologized to my family and it touched my heart. You know that I lost also my mother in this struggle. So that apology meant so much. Let me use the, this opportunity on behalf of Chief N.K. Abiola, because I know 
what you would have done. Let me use this opportunity to apologize to you, to apologize to your family for anything that he might have done to harm you and to harm your family. my first out-of-body experience I had yet another out-of-body experience and I felt I felt um, that my parents came to look and to see I felt like I was representing them at that moment in that space and I tried to communicate to the president to the government to the people um, the immense privilege that our family had had to play the role that we played. June 12th is the sort of gold standard, really, for Nigerian elections, which we should try and match up to as we move on from democratic elections to democratic elections. June 12th also set our gold standard in terms of um, how the nation should be, how the nation was united behind a vision rather than behind the multifarious fault lines, um, whether religion or tribe or region or whatever. It was uh, really a nationally created event. Chief Abiola was a symbol. Um, we were more or less the torch bearers. But really, June 12th was the creation of the Nigerian people. Um, on that day, I think they showed that all the cleavages which politicians normally exploit for electoral value um, they were upset. The significance of what we are doing today is that the president has had the courage to do what others failed to do. Secondly, he has shown tremendous courage in recognizing Abela as the president of this country. I am more than happy. I am more than happy because at least people who said we worked for nothing. Now I understand. Even if this politics, even if this politics is good, that we have got it now. When we state in our anthem that the labors of Europe shall never be in vain, this is a typical example of Nigeria that had demonstrated, demonstrated that. Long last, victory has been granted to the person who won an election. That all the returns we have had over the years have been brought to an end. Yes, the governor of Lagos State have declared June 12th for a work free day in this country in recognition of this, that monumental sacrifice. So it was not new to me. It touched my heart and, and it shook you know, every aspect of me. And I brought some memories back. And I was full of joy that at least I was part of a struggle to actualize that date and to immortalize the date. And so the ills of a quarter of a century were mended by the most unlikely president. The wounds that had festered for two and a half decades started a healing process in the young Nigerian nation. Now the future beckons. The democracy is still evolving and we are consolidating. Uh, sometimes, like in a football tournament, you want your team to quickly score, forgetting that the others two are 11 players. Somebody's running, you think he's not running fast enough. So we are evolving. Every other country passed through the stages we have followed. The, the only thing they say that you, have to, you, are, you are no longer discovering the wheel, so you should move faster than those who, who started it. But there's no country that just woke up and get to where they are. Even these dumb, uh, the big countries we are reading about, they, they have their own history. They have their low periods, they have their high periods. I would say so far so good. You know, uh, developing nation is a continuous pro uh, 
process. There are some successes, there are some lapses here and there. But as we go on, I hope the, you, the younger generation, will better the society and better the political system that is uh, uh, growing in the country. I think in Nigeria we should congratulate ourselves. We are bigger. We have over 250 cultures, each one thinking superior to the other. Yet, we are consolidating very seriously the values of multi-party democratic system. Uh, the elite should work very hard to educate people on the values of democracy. That is respect for the weak and the strong.